Wayside Baptist Church want to read to you tonight from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. As we come together tonight, as we watch tonight, and as we worship tonight, let us remember that Jesus is on the throne. Let us remember that Jesus is better. Let us remember that Jesus is supreme as we worship him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, what an awesome privilege it is that we can come together, that we can worship, that we can sing of your riches, and that we can open your word, we can hear your word explained. Lord, I, I miss the people of Eastside Baptist Church. I miss getting to see them every week. I miss the element of worship where we all get to come together and worship together. Lord, I pray in these days that you would give us wisdom. I pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom from above and help us to determine how to move forward. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good evening, church family. Wherever you are tonight, I want you to sing along. You've heard this song, and um, I want you to just let this be your testimony back to God. And let's just sing together and testify of His goodness. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. 
all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire in darkest night, you were close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, is running after me your goodness is running after, is running after me. With my life laid down, I surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. You know, church family, we can always sing of the goodness of God, for even when we can't see the good, God is working for our good. And Scripture tells us that He works all things for the good of those who believe in Him and trust in Him. And even in dark times, Troubled times, as we talked about this morning in today's service when Pastor Josh was preaching earlier about the trials that we're walking through. Even in the midst of those trials, God is good. Um, later on, you'll see another choir special. Again, there's no choir physically here tonight, but uh, the choir will be singing another special from the past here in just a few moments. Join with us now as we sing the chorus, God is so good. 
God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. As we think about how good God is to us and how good God has been to us, let us go to Him now in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, how good it is to be able to worship. How good it is to be able to freely read Your Word. How good it is to sing of Your glory and of Your majesty. How good it is to be able to come before you in prayer and to pray to you. Lord, I want to lift up the church family to you and pray that you would bless them. Lord, I want to lift up all that are watching tonight and pray that you would bless them. Lord, I ask that you would receive and that you would accept our worship to you tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
attention to what you've heard Don't drift away from the word Be warned, be warned Pay attention to what you've heard Don't drift away from the word of God By the angels was true And every sin received a just retribution If every time the law that was spoken by the angels The Lord burned with wrath when it was broken Do you think that His grace you'll have won If you reject what was said by His Son? Take your Bibles tonight and turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. And tonight we are going to examine verse 1 through verse 4. Join me in the text. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His own will. One of the most frightening moments in all of my life occurred while I was serving as the youth pastor in Siler City, North Carolina. Jessica and I had taken the youth to a camp, to a summer camp called Camp Caswell. The theme and the, and the push of the camp was this was a camp on the beach. But a problem had occurred. In Wilmington, North Carolina that year, there was a waste dump and you were not able to go swimming at Camp Caswell. The youth had been great all week and we decided to take the youth off campus, away from the camp, find a beach and to let them swim for an hour or two. So everything was going great. We drove to this beach and they got in the water and they were playing and they were swimming and they were floating and they were having a wonderful time. When a couple of the youth didn't realize nautical drifting occurs. They didn't realize the danger in drifting. And two of my youth, who at one time were having fun and were playing and were riding the waves, they had drifted away. Drifted into the undertow. The undertow had pulled them under. They'd come up and pull them back down. Come up and pull them back down. And it seemed as if, in their minds, they were going to drown. They had drifted into danger. They had drifted into the undertow when all of a sudden, a man appeared out of nowhere, grabbed them, pulled them out of the undertow, and helped them to safety. One moment, one moment living life, one moment swimming, the next moment drifting away into danger. Precious Church of Jesus Christ, I want to say to you tonight, That while there is such a thing as nautical drifting, there is also such a thing as spiritual drifting. And if we're not careful in our walk with Christ, we will drift spiritually. Maybe there is somebody listening to me tonight. 
Perhaps there is somebody viewing this from their phone screen or a computer screen or tablet screen and you are drifting away as we speak. You are spiritually drifting in your walk with Christ. It's not a question whether you know Christ. It's not a question of if are you saved? It's not a question of your relationship in terms of do you know Christ? But in your relationship with Christ, in your discipleship even with Christ, perhaps you are experiencing, perhaps you have experienced the moment of drifting away spiritually. Tonight, we want to look at this very thing. Tonight, we want to look at the the danger. Tonight, we want to look at how if we're not careful, we will drift away. Let us pray tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I want to thank you for such a text as this. I want to thank you, Lord, for this warning that we see so clearly in Hebrews 2. And Lord, I want to pray, Father, that your will would be done tonight. I want to pray that you would speak through the sacred text tonight. And I want to pray, Lord, that if there are those that are drifting spiritually, they would heed the warning of Hebrews 2 and fix what needs to be fixed in their life tonight. For it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. One main verb. One pushing verb, one pushing thought that occurs in the book of Hebrews, that occurs in this exposition, that is pushing through this exposition that the writer of Hebrews has placed before us, that the writer of Hebrews writes to us, and the main verb, and the main thing, and the unit of thought, and the theme is this, God is speaking. God has spoken. God continues to speak. In the times of old, God has used many spokesmen. God has spoken through many. God has spoken through the prophets of the Old Testament to the fathers. God has spoken through the biblical authors. God has spoken His revelation. God in Genesis spoke the world even into existence. The very theme of Hebrews, the very purpose of Hebrews is that God does speak. And in that speaking, the focus is the supremacy and the superiority of Christ. But in these final days, but in these complete days, God is speaking not through many spokesmen, God is speaking not through the prophets. God is speaking not through those of many, but God has chosen to speak through one spokesman. God has chosen to reveal His Word through one source, through one person, through one spokesman. And Hebrews 1 tells us that is the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have the revelation, we have the biblical word that God has spoken in these final complete days through His Son, Jesus Christ, who is superior and who is supreme over all creation and over everything. Remember, Jesus is Better, remember, Jesus is greater than anything we can imagine. Jesus is supreme. God speaks through Jesus. 
And Jesus had authority that the prophets did not have. Jesus has an authority, as in chapter 1, He contrasts Jesus the Son with that of angels, and Jesus has an authority that even the angels did not have. The angels were the creation of God. Jesus is the Creator. Angels were these profound worshipers. Jesus is the object of their worship. Angels were these great servants who serve. Jesus is the Son of the living God. Now, when we look at this text, when we look at Hebrews chapter 2, and we go back to chapter 1, and we set the context, and we set the stage, and we set what's really going on here in Hebrews, that Jesus is supreme, that Jesus is better, that Jesus is superior to anything and to everything, we must understand that more than the theme of Hebrews, The reason why the author starts in chapter 1 with speaking through Jesus. The reason why he starts in chapter 1 with first the prophets, but now in the final days Jesus, and then contrasts and compares him with that of angels is to set up the warning that he wants to deliver, the warning that he wants to give in chapter 2. The author of Hebrews, fond of doing exposition, as I told you Wednesday night, we can take the book of Hebrews and we can rightly see that the book of Hebrews is one long, one massive expository sermon where all through Hebrews, what you're going to see, what you're going to find are two things, exhortation and explanation. You're going to find the preacher who is preaching. You're going to find the preacher who's exhorting. You're going to find the preacher who's commanding. You're going to find the preacher who is warning. You're going to find the preacher who then, after doing those things, will explain. He'll set it up, as he did in chapter 1. He'll give the exhortation, as he does in chapter 2. And then he will explain after the exhortation and the command is given. It's important that we understand these warning passages in their proper context and in the proper light of how they are given. Some people make the grave mistake of thinking that the warning passages in Hebrews, all five of them, the warning passages are directed to non-believers. They are directed to non-Christians. They are directed to those who don't believe in Christ. And the warning is given that people would hear the warning, they would heed the warning, and they would turn to Christ and be saved. But I want to give you a warning of caution. I want to give you a warning to understand the rightful context of the warning passages. Remember, the book of Hebrews is a book of exposition. It is a book of a sermon. It is a book that is given, that is preached, that is delivered to the church, to believers, to Christians. And the author of Hebrews, the preacher that is exhorting, the preacher that is commanding, the preacher that is warning, the preacher that is doing all of this, please understand that preacher has placed himself in that category, and in that list himself. For the warning passages to be directed to non-Christians and non-believers would suggest that even the author of Hebrews needs to come to Christ, and that just can't be. A second reason why I would tell you tonight that it is for those that know Christ is if you rightly understand the context of the warning passages. In the passage we're looking at tonight, chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, 
the context is. Those that are drifting away spiritually. Those that are struggling in their walk with Christ. Those that at one time were on fire. Those that at one time were passionate. Those that at one time were truly living a disciple's life, but have started to drift. They've started to leave spiritual things behind. They have started to read the Bible less. They have started to pray less. They have started to attend Bible studies less. They have started to worship less. That the warning is to turn around. The warning is to come back. The warning is to not continue down the road and the path of spiritual obscurity as you are heading and going. In the broader context, The warning passages are teaching Christians press on to maturity. Beware of spiritual drifting. Beware, be careful in your walk with Christ, lest you drift spiritually. So tonight, as we look at this text before us. Tonight, as we examine chapter 2, after looking at this context and understanding the context into which it is written, let us rightly examine what the author of Hebrews is trying to get across to the church of Jesus Christ. Trying to get across here in chapter 2. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1 with me. It reads this way. Therefore, now that's taking all the context and that's now plunging into the warning. Therefore, we, meaning the church, must give the more earnest heed, it's important, to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Therefore, take the superiority of Christ. Take the supremacy of Christ. Take the message of Christ. Take His person, who He is. Take His work, what He has done. And is Jesus supreme in your life? Is the supremacy of Christ real to you? Is the supremacy of Christ valid in your life? Is the supremacy of Christ really the main driving force in your discipleship? Do you have discipleship in your life? Are you growing as a disciple in your walk with Christ? Let me tell you one of my greatest fears as I look at this text. One of the greatest fears is, I speak to you, church family, and as I speak to anybody listening to this message tonight, there is a great temptation. There is a great possibility that we could take things like our culture. We could take things like family. We could take take things like our church. We could take things like the superficial way that a culture interprets the truth. We can take those different compartments of our lives. And those things could be so loud. And those things could pound so heavy on the door. And those things could be so overwhelming to us that we would ignore the Word of God that we would ignore that Jesus is supreme, that we would ignore His rightful place as heir of all things, as the sacrifice, as the one who has atoned sin, that we would ignore the lordship of Jesus Christ, that He is Lord over our lives. And what we would do is, we would treat Jesus with contempt. We would treat Jesus with neglect. 
We would treat Jesus neglecting him and his message and who he is. We would treat Jesus inferior and we would treat these areas of our life as superior. What we would do is we would take these areas that maybe even make up something of a cultural type of Christianity, a southern type of Christianity, without realizing and truly understanding a biblical Christianity. A biblical Christianity that puts Jesus as superior and puts us as inferior. That puts Jesus as superior and our families as inferior. That puts Jesus as superior and puts our culture as inferior. That puts Jesus as superior and puts everything else as inferior. Be careful. See to it that we stay close to Jesus, lest we drift away spiritually. Jesus is better. Jesus is greater. Better than anything we can imagine. Greater than just fill in the blank. Choose or pick whatever you want. And Jesus is greater and Jesus is better than that thing we would pick. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is superior based on who he is, his person, his sacrifice, his atonement of sin, based on his very work on the cross. You know what's interesting? In the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 14, Jesus had been off somewhere praying. The disciples were on a boat. It was evening. It was dark. And here comes Jesus walking along on the water. And the disciples think it's a ghost. They don't know it's Jesus. They don't know it's their Lord. They don't know it's their Master. And Jesus is walking on top of the water. And finally, Peter Wanting to know it's Jesus, says, Jesus, if it's really you, let me walk out to you on the water. And Jesus invites Peter to come and walk on water like he's walking on water. Peter steps out of the boat, steps onto the water, and he walks right out onto the water with Jesus. And here he is, walking on the water. Here he is with Jesus. Lord, Master, Savior, Superior. And he's there with Jesus on the water. But this doesn't last very long, church. This doesn't last very long, disciples of Christ. Because what happens is the storm gets to be heavy. The waves get to be very visible. And he takes superiority of Christ. He takes the supremacy of Christ. He takes the fact that it really doesn't matter how rough the storm gets. It doesn't matter how large the waves get. It doesn't matter what is happening at that very moment because he's with Jesus. But it's loud and it's pounding and it's really hitting hard. And you know the story. Peter looks at these waves, he looks at the storm, he's fearful of the storm, even though Jesus is right there, he's fearful of the storm, he takes his eyes off Jesus and he begins to drown. And he cries out, Jesus, save me! Jesus, save me! Lord, save me! Have you ever asked yourself in reading that text, and hearing that story as we've heard that story a million times, have you ever really thought through what's going on in that text? I'll tell you exactly what's happening in that text. I'll tell you exactly what's going on in that text. Peter saw Jesus as superior and supreme, and he was able to do unreal things like walk on water. But then, Peter looking at the storm around him and the waves around him and all the physical around him, 
began to see those things as superior and began to see Jesus as inferior and he took his eyes off Jesus and he sank and he drowned and he cried out to the Lord Jesus to save him and Jesus saved him. We need to take special care in our lives. We need to think our discipleship. We need to think about our spiritual lives. We need to think about the church in terms of our relationship to Jesus is we are inferior to Him. He is superior. And do we live our lives in that way? Do we serve Jesus in that way? Does our discipleship reflect that truth that Jesus in our life is superior and that Jesus in our life is supreme? Or have we taken on some kind of context where things in our life are superior to Christ? And according to that, we treat Jesus as He is inferior, as if He is inferior to what culture says, to our families, to our friends, to those things. It's something for us to consider. It's something for us to think of as we look at this very real and this very passionate warning from the author of Hebrews, from the preacher who is preaching, who is exhorting his own congregation. And remember, be careful. Be watchful. Stay close to Jesus. Least ye drift spiritually. It is incredibly easy for us to drift away Spiritually. Perhaps you know people that at one time they were active in the church. One time they served as a deacon. One time they served as a Sunday school teacher. At one time they were a VBS worker. At one time they were as active as active can be within the church of Jesus Christ. They served the church. They were a part of the church. They had their paw prints all over the church. And then, one day, they were doing less and less and less. And now, when you think about some of those people, you would say, man, I don't know what ever happened to him. I don't know what ever happened to her. I'm not exactly sure what happened there, but they won't even darken the door of a church now. I know where they live. I know they're still here in the town of Liberty. I still see him at the grocery store. But for some reason, they just won't come to church. For some reason, they just won't gather. For some reason, they just aren't part of what. Oftentimes, I'll I'll hear people say, such and such left the church. Did he get mad? Did she get mad about that? Did they get mad about something? They just leave the church? Can I tell you tonight, that it almost never happens that somebody just all of a sudden gets mad and leaves the church. What happens more than anything else is Christians drift spiritually. At one time, they prayed dependently. And then over time, they just quit praying so much until it got to a place to where they barely ever prayed. They used to worship and come to every service because they desired to be fed by the Word. And they desired to have the Word of God poured into them. But then they stopped coming on Sunday night, once a month. And then they got to where they never at all Sunday night or Wednesday night. And then before you knew it, they were at the lake on Sunday, or they were here Sunday, or they were there Sunday, or they were all of a sudden not here 
anymore at all. At one time, they signed up for every Bible study that was offered in the church. And then it got to be where Bible studies just weren't the priority anymore to where they didn't even study the Bible at all. This is drifting. And if you were to ask me tonight, well, how does one drift? How does one get to a place where they begin to drift off into danger? How can we be careful, stay close to Jesus so we don't drift if we don't understand how we drift in the first place? Precious church of Jesus Christ, if you want to know how people drift, let me tell you, by doing nothing. When we sit back and when we do nothing and when we just sit there, rest assured, a drift begins to happen. We must be intentional. We must be purposeful. We must seek the Lord with all of our heart to grow in Christ and to fight against a spiritual drift. Be careful. Stay close to Jesus. Least you drift spiritually. Go back to verse 2. Let's read it again. I'm sorry, verse 1. Let's read it again. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. When we read the Word of God, it's very important that we absorb the Word. It's very important that we come to the Word with clarity. In the way that you read the book of Psalms, is different than the way you would read a gospel and a parable and a proverb and different than the way that you would read an epistle with an imperative command like we see in chapter 2 and verse 1. This is the beauty of genre. So when you open your Bible and you study the Word of God, Understand the beauty of genre and understand what genre is and understand that this determines how you can understand the teaching of the Word of God. The author of Hebrews is not just giving a warning. He's not just giving a command, but he's giving a strong, forceful, imperative command. Again, you see in verse 1, him say, therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. The warning, the command is give more earnest heed to that which has been spoken, to that which has been said. Give more earnest heed to the supremacy of Christ and the role that He has in your life. And the question, is Jesus supreme? Is Jesus superior in your life? Jesus is speaking. God is speaking through Jesus. And through this command, He's saying, take the more earnest heed so that you don't drift away spiritually. In Matthew 7, we see an imperative like this in verse 13, where Jesus is saying, enter through the narrow gate. The word enter is what we would call an aorist imperative. It is a command with urgency. It is a command saying, do it now, respond now, come now, enter now and enter this way through this gate. And here in Hebrews, the author is passionately, forcefully, powerfully saying, take the more earnest heed. That stop, listen, consider, count it, understand it, and do it. Submit not to your feelings. Submit not to just thoughts you have. Submit to the Word of God. 
Submit to the truth of God. Submit to the heed. Submit to the command. Submit to the warning that is given. That we are to take heed and pay special and pay close attention to the things which we have heard. I ask you again, what role does Jesus play in your life? What role does Jesus have in your life? Is he superior? Is he supreme? Is he truly better and greater than all things in your life? You see, when we look at this text, when we look at this warning, we see a salvation that is reliable. I want you to look at verse 2 and verse 3 with me. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, now look at verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. What in the world do angels have to do with drifting? What do angels have to do with this warning? What do angels have to do with the superiority of Christ? What do angels have to do with God speaking? Understand the illustration the author is using. The author is taking us back to where Moses has led the people out of slavery, out of Egypt. He has led those people through the wilderness. He is leading them into the promised land, but we know Moses won't be the one to actually lead them there, but he's taking them on this journey. They stop at this point. Moses is called to go up on Mount Sinai and receive the law, to receive the Ten Commandments. And he gets these commandments. But understand, Moses didn't go up there, drink a cup of coffee, finish his coffee, and walk on down. He was up on that mountain for quite some time. He was up on that mountain for a long time. And you have to understand the people of Israel. They knew slavery. They were enslaved. They had a system of idol worship. They had been in slavery in Egypt for a very long time. They had walked with Moses on this journey. Uh, and you have to understand that in slavery, while things were hard and things were bad, one thing they had was stability. Things were stable. They knew what time they were going to eat. They knew how many meals a day they were going to get. They had a guarantee when they were walking with God, there was no guarantee. There was no stability as such. It was all by faith. It was all by promise. It was all by trusting God. It was all by God providing for them, not something that from experience they knew they were going to have. They had to trust God. So they trusted God. But now even Moses had ditched them. Moses had left. Moses had gone on top of the mountain. What were they to think? So they did what they know, they did what they knew to do. They did what was easy and convenient for them. They did what they had learned forever to do was to revert back to idol worship. They started melting things down and they began to worship the golden calf began to worship these idols. During this time, Moses comes down from the mountain. He sees what's going on, and Moses is irate. Now remember, while Moses while he was getting the law from God, the role the angels had was they mediated the law for God. God used angels to mediate the law to Moses. And Moses comes down and he finds this idolistic worship happening. And he's irate. And he breaks the tablet. Don't worry, God gives him another one. But in breaking 
this commandment, we need to understand that God was not okay with their sin. God was not okay with their spiritual drift. God was not okay with them disobeying Him. God did not have such a relationship with them where they could just kind of say, well, God, you know, you took a long time and I just kind of got back into this. And God said, well, that's all right, things happen. No. If you look at verse uh, 2 again, bottom of verse 2, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. God did not let the sin go. God punished the sin. God sent a plague to come during this time and punish and discipline the children of Israel for walking away and drifting away from God. Now understand the author of Hebrews and what he's doing. Understand what he's saying. He is warning his congregation. He is warning the church of drifting away into sin. Drifting the w- away from God. Drifting away from everything that they knew concerning what they've heard concerning what's been spoken, concerning the superiority and supremacy of Christ. And you may be thinking right now, sitting where you are, well, well, pastor, well, preacher Josh, that's never going to happen to me. I would never drift. I would never have a less attitude for God's word and worship and prayer than I do right now. Listen, I appreciate what you're saying, but That could never happen to me. My counsel back to you would be, be careful. Least you drift spiritually because it takes nothing to drift and it takes everything to grow. Go out in the ocean sometime and just stand there. Just float in the ocean. Just lay on your back and see in just a few brief moments if you don't drift further out than you really wanted to be. Some of you are lake people. Get out there on the lake. Get on your back and float away. Close your eyes for just a few moments and you'll realize before you know it, you're out further than you really wanted to be. Be, be careful or else you will drift spiritually and all the dangers that come along with that. Not only do we have um, verse 2 going on, but in verse 3, verse 3 is the reason why so many people believe that the warning passages are directed to lost people. Look at verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him? They look at the neglect in the text. How shall we escape if we neglect So great a salvation. Well, here it is. They neglected the salvation. But understand, there is a difference between the word neglect and between the word reject. They didn't reject salvation. They didn't reject faith in Christ. They didn't reject those things. They neglected. Understand tonight that as a believer in Jesus Christ, as somebody who's been discipled, somebody who's been baptized, somebody who's been in the church for a very long time, you can come to a place in your walk with Christ where you begin to neglect the things of God. You neglect the Word by closing it and not reading it. You neglect prayer by not doing it. You neglect walking with the Lord when we don't take advantage of times of Bible study. We don't take advantage of being a part when the church meets. If there has 
been a positive thing that has come out of this uh, trial we've all been going through, this time of panic, this time of pandemic, is that we appreciate the assembling more. We appreciate the coming together more. I can't wait till that day that I can invite you back into the church and that all of the church can be the church coming together once again, assembling together once again. When we neglect, we begin to drift away. When we begin to drift away, we begin to neglect more and more and more of the things of God. Absolutely you can be saved and neglect the things of God. We as believers can backslide. Neglect so great, so massive of a salvation that God has given us. A second thing I see in this text is we have been given a verified salvation. How is our salvation verified? In verse 3, we are told that the Lord spoke it. Spoke it first through the prophets. Spoke it then through His Son in these final complete days. It's been spoken by God, and it's been heard by humanity. Humanity has heard the Word of God. They have heard it preached. They have witnessed it. It has been recorded. It has been written. We have it spoken and we have it heard. But look at verse 4. God also bearing witness both with signs, wonders, various miracles, Gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. We have a salvation that is reliable because it's been spoken by God, heard by us. It's been verified through miracles, through gifts of the Spirit, through signs, through wonders, and through the work of the Holy Spirit of God. God. Now let me say this. If you are watching and viewing this tonight, and through the process of this message, you have come to understand that while this is written to Christians, and while this is a warning of the spiritual drifting and neglecting of salvation that believers can experience, in their spiritual lives, you might say tonight, I don't have a salvation that can be neglected. I don't have a salvation that I can drift from. I don't believe I have a relationship with Christ that I can drift away. And let me tell you, before you settle anything else, before you live one more day, I implore you to trust Christ as your Savior. I invite you to ask Jesus to come into your life and to save you. I offer you an invitation that leads to a life with Jesus that involves you repenting of sin, laying sin at the foot of the cross, believing in the atonement where Jesus went to the cross and died for you and died for your sins. And by you saying, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus, I believe in you. Remember the thief on the cross. He wasn't baptized. He didn't get discipled. He believed and Jesus said, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Are you willing tonight to reach out? Are you willing tonight to repent of sin, turn from sin, give it to God? Are you willing tonight to ask Jesus to come into your life and save you? And as you've heard me say over and over again, if that's happened to you tonight, if you want to give your life to Jesus tonight, if tonight is the night where you have repented of sin and you have asked Jesus to come into your life and save you and you want to know, as sure as you're watching this tonight, 
I'm a believer of Jesus and I'm on my way to heaven and you've trusted him tonight, I would so appreciate you reaching out to us by Facebook. I would love to know about it. I would love to celebrate with you. I would love to be praying for you. I would love to add you to my personal prayer list and be praying for you as a disciple as you have experienced new birth tonight. Now for the rest of us, for those of us who know Christ, for those of us who have been saved, for those of us who are disciples of Jesus, understand the warning. Understand the necessary heed. Understand the command. Understand that if we just sit back and do nothing, we will drift spiritually. Understand that again, what this time has given us and the way God has blessed us through this time is we have to be intentional and we have to be purposeful and we have to really desire worship over fellowship. We have to desire worship just over seeing people. We have to desire worship over just coming to a place. We have to get our Bibles ready. We have to get online. We have to go online at this time and we have to be able to to view it live. We have to do it at a certain time and we have to really want to be poured into that God is using to grow disciples. But it's possible that during this time we can also drift away. Tonight, I want to simply ask you, where are you with Christ? Is he superior? Is he supreme in your life? Or have you just accepted the cultural Christianity's idea of faith? Here's Jesus, here's God, Here's family, here's friends, here's culture, here's my job. And I just, I just kind of go through the motions and just kind of do my thing without Jesus being superior, and without him being Lord over our lives. If you need to get before God tonight, say, Lord, I've been drifting. You haven't been supreme or superior in my life. Other things have taken that role. I tonight want to rededicate. I tonight want to commit. I tonight want to seek the Lord, to stop drifting, to plant my feet in the sand, and to walk to shore. And I want growth in my life. I don't want to drift any longer. Tonight, if that's you, tonight if God has spoken through his word to you, and you want to be a serious disciple, and I can pray for you. Message me. Reach out to me. Reach out and let me know so I can be praying for you. If you want me to help you in your discipleship, even if you don't come to this church, you've never been to this church, you're just watching online, but I can help you and I can be a part of that discipleship for you. Reach out to me. I'll be praying for you. Let us pray tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I am so grateful for the opportunity to preach such a rich passage as Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Lord, I am so falling deep in love with the book of Hebrews. I pray my congregation and everyone watching is falling in love with this deep book, with this awesome book that's all about your son Jesus as superior and supreme and how you've spoken through him in these last complete final days. I pray for those that have made decisions and I pray, Lord, that you would do something awesome in their life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray tonight. Amen. See you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock as we'll look back at Hebrews again. God bless you. Thank you.